Between its multiverse, infinite Ricks and Mortys on the central finite curve, and the mysterious past we're just now learning about thanks to Season 5, Rick and Morty can be a tricky show to map out. Like, really tricky. But don't worry, I'm here to turn this wibbly wobbly mess into, into um... You know, I'm gonna be honest with you. Yeah, it's gonna be messy. So let's plot out what we know so far from seasons one through five about Rick and Morty's timeline. To make things easier, I'm going to refer to Rick of C-137 and his current Morty, the two that we always follow, as Rick and Morty. I'll specifically be looking at their timeline and tracking them out. As infinite realities means infinite origin stories and infinite... Uh, well, you know the deal. We start pre-Rick and Morty, before season 1, and what we know so far of Rick C-137's past. Rick was already into inventing even at a young age, as we see in Rick C-137's memory from the season 5 episode, Ricternal Friendshine of the Spotless Mort. While it's unclear how old he is, it does seem like this took place somewhere between the 60s or 70s, as we hear the babysitter talk about changing in front of him and say, That modeling my new pantyhose in plain view of the living room. Honestly, the kid could come watch, I'd welcome it. This cultural time period's cool like that. And that would be the era of free love. Rick's interest in this would indicate we're looking at a teenage Rick here. At some point, he met his wife and they had a child. Rick and his family resided in Muskegon, Michigan, as we know thanks to Beth mentioning it in Me Seeks and Destroy. I'm just saying, somewhere along the way, I lost that wide-eyed girl from Muskegon. Beth was born in the year, likely 1980, or around there. And how do we know that? Uh, well, we don't. But we can do some math to approximate. You see, in Season 2's episode Morty Night Run, Rick drops Jerry off at the Jerry Burry. He marks the date as January 12, 2015. Meanwhile, in Season 1's Rick's D Minutes, we learn Summer's age. You can't leave! You're 17! Yeah, and I'm not pregnant! That means Summer was born in 1998. Beth, meanwhile, became pregnant with Summer when she went to prom with Jerry and had unprotected sex. At this point, she would have likely been either 17 or 18, added 9 months of pregnancy, and Summer would have been born when Beth was 18 or 19. So subtract that from 1998, and Beth was born in either 1980 or 1979. I swear, not everything's going to be this complicated. Probably. We don't know too much about Beth's childhood, outside of that she was an incredibly difficult kid. You were a scary f***ing kid, man. Oh my god. I didn't make Fruity Land to get rid of you, Beth. I did it to protect the neighborhood. Due to this, maybe around 1987, Rick created Fruity Land for childhood Beth, a land that, for all intents and purposes, should have been completely safe for children to play without any risk of injury. However, Beth being the evil child she apparently was, pushed one of her best friends Tommy into honey and forever left him in Fruity Land. Er, allegedly. She definitely did it. A little later on, we get the origin story that I have to mention. In Season 3's Rick Shank Redemption, Rick showcases the story of how he ended up inventing the portal gun. It involves his wife Diane and daughter being murdered by another interdimensional Rick, which then prompts him to complete his own portal gun. What are you talking about? This is a memory. You, you can't alter details of a memory. True, but you can alter anything you want about a totally fabricated origin story. So, how much of this is true? Is Rick's wife a blonde-haired woman named Diane? Did the Rick we know invent his portal gun after several other Ricks? Well, here's the rub. Despite Rick claiming the origin story we saw in Season 3 was completely fabricated, we finally get his memories of his past in Season 5's episode, Rick Murai Jack, as well as some elements that may or may not be totally true from Bird Person's memory in Episode 8. In this memory sequence, we see that Rick's totally fabricated origin story is apparently almost completely true, even the fact that Beth is dead. You're one of those creeps who moves in with abandoned adult Beth. It's more complicated than that. You live with a version of our dead daughter. The only difference I can spot is that he doesn't immediately figure out how to create his portal gun as seen in the fabricated origin story. Instead, it takes him some time to grieve before he becomes determined and finally invents the gun. Rick's mission becomes to find and hunt down the other Rick who killed his family. At this point, we're going to delve into Bird Person's memories, as we can trust these ones, since these are events that directly involve Bird Person. 
At around the time Rick turned 35, Rick meets both Squanchy and Bird Person at a galactic Burning Man festival named Burning Man, where they begin a band together that will later go on to be called the Flesh Curtains. Bird Person and Rick seem to strike up a deal. If Bird Person helps Rick hunt down and find the Rick who killed his family, Rick will help Bird Person fight off the Galactic Federation. Listen, you help me do my stuff, I'll help you do your stuff. Just shoot the me's with sci-fi haircuts. As indicated by Bird Person's memories at the historic childhood trauma town, when Bird Person was just a child, the Galactic Federation took over his home planet and round up all of the children, leading to Bird Person's hatred of the Galactic Federation. Many other species have lost their home planets, like him, to the Galactic Federation, while others are trying to protect their planets from said Federation. One of these is Gear Dude, who is Gearhead's older brother. All the important points seem pretty clear, no? They think they control the galaxy, I disagree. Don't hate the player, hate the game. This leads to the Battle of Blood Ridge, a major battle meant to stop the Galactic Federation's offensive movement. In this timeline, the Freedom Fighters win. Bird Person's big day, Morty, was at Blood Ridge on Clap Flap's third moon against the Gromphlemites. However, at some point, maybe during the battle or after, Gear Dude passes away. The road your father and I walk together is soaked deeply with the blood of both friends and enemies. After this battle, Rick offers to take Bird Person adventuring with him across dimensions. But Bird Person declines, wanting to fight on against the Federation in his own dimension. Distraught, Rick goes back to trying to find and kill his family's murderer. This leads him to finding a cult of Ricks who uses the Citadel Ricks R logo prior to the Citadel's existence and hunting them down, as he believes his wife's killer is among these. Meanwhile, the Rick who actually belonged to the version of Beth we know from the beginning of Season 1 disappeared when she was young. I used to have to draw them into family photos with a crayon. While Rick is away, Beth gives birth to both Summer and Morty, and she marries Jerry. The two fight over how to raise the kids, and Summer is raised with a very hands-off approach, which Jerry thinks was a mistake, so Morty is raised with a very hands-on approach to a disapproving Beth. It does seem like Rick C-137 would occasionally travel to an abandoned Beth's dimension in order to check in on a version of his family possibly the same dimension of Morty who we've seen throughout the show. In Season 1's Close Recounters of the Rick Kind, we see that Rick has a memory of picking up baby Morty. Similarly, in Season 2's Get Swifty, Bird Person shows Morty a photo of Rick holding an even younger baby Morty. Of course, you can only fight the Galactic Federation for so long before becoming a major bounty to them. As such, Ricks begin to be hunted, and a few thousand Ricks decide to form the Citadel and Council of Ricks. Initially, this was a very primitive version of the Citadel of Ricks. Rick C-137 fights off and murders practically all of the members of this version. The surviving Ricks worship him and seem to pitch starting a bigger, bolder Citadel of Ricks with him. And let's speak on the Citadel for a moment because this is important. One of the best ways to hide from the Galactic Federation and Citadel of Ricks is with a Morty. You're a camouflage. Camouflage? Due to his genius, Rick's brainwaves emit a traceable and distinctive brainwave. Thus, Rick's need to find someone who is just as dumb as they were smart, which just so happened to be Rick's grandson, Morty. See, when, when, when a Rick is with a Morty, the genius waves get canceled out by the, uh, <clears throat> Morty waves. Oof, harsh. And it goes further than that. Breaking down what we learn in episode 10 of season 5, it seems the Citadel of Ricks purposely tricked Beths and Jerry's into falling in love. Once a Morty is born, they gather his DNA to either transfer him to the Citadel, or more likely create brand new Mortys out of the DNA. These Mortys are then given fake memories of the Rick they're going to serve, and then transported to serve that actual Rick. How much Rick C-137 is involved with this process is unknown, but he was given the plans to the Citadel and possibly part of the planning process as he has the schematics for the Citadel's dimensional drive in his brain. This may very well mean he was also involved in the creation of the Central Finite Curve, a wall the Citadel Ricks built around the universe, separating and creating a barrier between all of the possible universes where Rick isn't the smartest man in the universe and the ones where he is. We built a wall around infinity. We separated all the infinite universes from all the infinite universes where he's the smartest man in the universe. It's unclear what Rick's motivation was, as he hates the Citadel and his original mission was to go and kill everyone in the first version of the Citadel, but it's possible he either still hadn't found his wife's killer, so was playing ball in order to get more Ricks in one place, 
or he had just given up at that point and given in to being worshipped by the other Ricks. Either way, he specifically abandons the Citadel before it's even complete. As Rick ditches the Citadel, he crashes his normal, not made out of trash spaceship right into the home of one of his Beths, and who's likely the Morty we know's actual mother, which is essentially the start to Rick and Morty Season 1. Or, well, around two months before the start of Season 1, Rick returns to bring Morty on several Rick and Morty style adventures before the season has even begun. We know this as Principal Vagina, no relation, tells Beth and Jerry during the pilot episode. The fact is, your son Morty has attended this school for a total of seven hours over the last two months. What? Why didn't you notify us? I done been notifying you. Have you not been getting the messages? I've been leaving with Morty's grandfather? Rick's flying vehicle we see throughout the season is built at this point about two months in. What do you think of this flying vehicle, Morty? I built it out of stuff I found in the garage. Yeah, Rick, it's it's great. At this point, Rick and Morty's adventures mostly involve making sure Morty can still adventure with Rick. The duo adventure to get Mega C's, which make Morty seem incredibly smart as a temporary side effect from sticking them up his butt. Morty, t -t tell your parents the square root of pi. Oh, come on, Rick, you know I can't. The square root of pi, Morty, go. 1.772453853. Whoa! What the hell? Holy crap, he's right! This helps Rick convince Beth and Jerry to let Morty continue adventuring with him. Their next quest involves incepting Mr. Goldenfold into giving Morty good grades despite Morty's absence from class. In the process, the Smith's dog Snuffles becomes super intelligent and ends up leaving Earth with other intelligent dogs to create their own civilization. Do not call me that! <laughs> Snuffles was my slave name. You shall now call me Snowball, because my fur is pretty and white. Oh, uh, sorry, Snowball. Morty has his first brief physical encounter with a girl, Annie, at Anatomy Park before Rick quickly ruins it for him. Hold your breath! Whoa, whoa, what the hell, Rick? What the hell? Man, I liked her! I really had something going there, Rick! Yes, yeah, so I heard. You, you dodged a bullet, Morty. Meanwhile, Jerry learns his parents now have an extra lover in the equation, and we learn Summer has started dating a classmate named Ethan. In M. Night Shyamalan's, Rick single-handedly wipes out Zygerians who plot to steal his equation for concentrated dark matter. Jerry has also been captured by the Zygerians, where he attempts to pitch his Hungry for Apples campaign to his bosses. While it's successful in the terrible simulation, he tries it again in real life only to get fired from his job, something that becomes a running issue for him. Rick introduces the Smith Sanchez family to the Meeseeks box, which produces the recurring Meeseeks character who appears to help fulfill one request by a user who presses its box. This is also the episode where Rick finally lets Morty choose their adventure, betting that it will be terrible. If Morty wins, Morty will get the right to choose every 10th adventure they go on. While the adventure is shaping out to be especially poor with Morty nearly sexually assaulted, Rick shows a rare moment of true heart, both helping to obliterate the sexual predator and save Morty's adventure, thus giving Morty his Morty adventure card we'll end up seeing down the line. Soon after, in Rick Potion number 9, Morty will be attending what's probably the worst idea for a school dance, the annual flu season dance, and wants Rick to make him a love potion to make Jessica fall in love with him. Rick complies, failing to take into account its flu season, which ends up causing the entire school to fall in love with Morty. Rick tries to create an even more contagious anti-serum. I, I basically mixed this with a more contagious flu virus. It should neutralize the whole thing, Morty. Huh. Sounds somehow familiar. This fails miserably, and eventually Rick accidentally turns the entire world into Cronenberg monsters. Cronenberg monsters being horrific body horror creatures spoofing director David Cronenberg who is known for his body horror. And this is when things get especially tricky. As Rick C-137's family, including Beth, died, we don't actually know which dimension we're currently in. Although it is worth noting that Morty himself thinks he's from dimension C-137. I'm Morty C-137! Look, I still have a lot of questions about the fact Rick's origin story from Season 3 was supposed to be completely fabricated, and yet in Season 5 that seems to be pretty much his actual origin story. Additionally, in Season 1's Close Recounters of the Rick Kind, one of the Ricks states that the killing of 27 Ricks in their own timeline is... An UNPRECEDENTED RICKICIDAL EPIDEMIC! So Rick's past of murdering countless other Ricks would also completely contradict that. Anyways, for the time being, I'm going to refer to this dimension as maybe C-137, even though it probably isn't, as there's no other good way to refer to it that my small brain can think of. 
Rick has accidentally turned all of Earth, maybe C-137, into Cronenberg monsters, aside from the maybe C-137 Smith slash Sanchez family, who are all immune to his concocted infections. At this point, maybe C-137 Beth completely rejects Rick, Beth and Jerry truly fall in love with each other, and Beth, Jerry, and Summer begin living out their days hunting and eating Cronenberg monsters. Rick and Morty, on the other hand, find an alternate timeline where another Rick has conveniently cured their Cronenbergering. But, well... <laughs> The Rick and Morty of that dimension died immediately afterwards, so Rick and Morty C-137 swoop in, bury the dead versions of themselves, and replace them, meaning from here on out, Summer, Beth, and Jerry are definitely not from the same dimension as Rick and Morty. In Raising Gazorpazorp, Morty ends up fathering a half-Gazorpian child which fully grows up in a day and writes a novel about how bad of a parent he was. This is also when Summer has her first adventure with Rick. In Rick's The Minutes, Summer discovers she was nearly aborted, and Morty shows her his grave, letting her in on the fact that he and Rick aren't technically her brother and grandfather. Close Recounters of the Rick Kind sees the first appearance of Evil Morty. Evil Morty has been controlling a Rick in order to capture and kill various Ricks, while also downloading the contents of their brains. Meanwhile, their Mortys are captured and used as a giant barrier to block the brainwaves from other Ricks. While Evil Morty's scheme is foiled by our Rick and Morty, it's not entirely clear why he was doing it... yet. Notably, he did manage to scan much of Rick C-137's brain. Rick and Summer both throw a giant party in Rick's C business when Beth and Jerry leave on a trip, and through it, Rick's longtime friend Bird Person meets Summer's friend Tammy, and the two hook up on Rick's workbench, before later leaving to hook up again. They completely trash the house, and Rick uses a time crystal, completely stopping time and allowing for the three to clean before Beth and Jerry realize they've thrown a party, leading to... Season 2, and definitely the year 2015. It's one of the few things we can cement down, so it bears repeating. After restoring time, it turns out Rick has stolen a time crystal from testicle monsters, and the group's uncertainty means their time is split apart. We're exactly like a man capable of sustaining a platonic friendship with an attractive female co-worker. We're entirely hypothetical. After solving that crisis, there's a popular theory worth mentioning. In Episode 2's Morty Night Run, Rick drops Jerry off at Jerry Burry, and Rick and Morty go on a classic adventure involving Gear World and stopping a fart from destroying all carbon-based life. More importantly though, when Rick drops off Jerry, he receives a ticket to clarify which Jerry is his, number 5126. During the episode, we follow Rick and Morty, and notably, Rick takes some green crystals with little purple crystals growing out of them. Later on, at the end of the episode, the following happens to the Rick and Morty we've been following all episode. Hey wait, uh, do you have 5126? Uh, I'm not sure. Morty. Uh, that's a Blitz and Chits ticket. What? Way to go, Morty. Eh, whatever. Uh, uh, wh wait, what? So there's a couple things that could have happened here. Perhaps the Rick on the left had the wrong Jerry, 5126, and was trying to exchange him for the correct one, hence why I asked if they had ticket number 5126. Really though, the main point is the humor of Rick possibly taking the wrong Jerry and not caring. This is my interpretation, but it's not the only one. Another theory goes that Rick and Morty on the left have ticket number 5126 and are looking for their Jerry. That would mean the Rick and Morty we've been following all episode long after the credit sequence, who went on an adventure with Fart and got those crystals, has been an entirely different Rick and Morty from C-137. So if this theory is correct... It goes even further in episode 4, Total Rickhaul, which showcases Rick throwing away these very same crystals, meaning episode 4 shows an entirely different Rick and Morty than the ones we followed most of the show. The intro for the episode is entirely different, showing Mr. Poopy Butthole as a character who accompanied Rick and Morty on all of their adventures, and is now shown in every single intro scene. He's also a lifelong friend of the characters, yet someone we'd never seen before in the show. Meaning that episode 4 also follows an entirely different Rick and Morty than C-137 and the ones we typically watch in the show. It would also mean that Mr. Poopy Butthole isn't a big part of Rick C-137's world. Up until season 4, Mr. Poopy Butthole only appeared at the end of season Stingers on his own. However, in season 4 he finally makes another appearance and one flew over the Cuckoo's Morty. Here, his entire storyline is acknowledged of becoming a professor, merging with the storyline of Beth and Jerry getting back together, and Beth becoming more strict about Morty's adventures with Rick. 
So it kind of defeats the theory a little bit, unless this is yet again another Rick and Morty, which is possible as there's a near infinite number of them, and the theory goes on to state that unless it's explicitly stated that we're following Rick C-137, we could be following any number of those near infinite Ricks. It's an interesting theory for sure, which is why I brought it up, but for the sake of this timeline, I'm going to assume that, unless it's stated otherwise, we're always following Rick C-137. Okay, back to Season 2. In total recall, Beth assumes Mr. Poopy Butthole's another parasite and ends up shooting him, sending him to the hospital where he decides not to press charges. Rick and Morty save the world from a reality show creating the smash hit Get Schwifty. This leads to their first interaction with the President of the United States, who will go on to call the two for help with unexplained sci-fi mysteries. We also learn that Tammy is still with Bird Person, and their one-night stand has extended to a full-blown relationship. We learn that Rick's battery which powers his car is a microverse battery, which has an entire mini-universe recreated inside that powers Rick's car with many people creating electricity for Rick. Rick helps Summer and Morty kill a vampire by becoming Tiny Rick, and in doing so, we learn about his Operation Phoenix, a fallback plan involving creating clones of himself he can put his memories into in case his physical body dies. He axes this particular dimension's Operation Phoenix, but that doesn't mean other dimensions won't still maintain the program. Morty and Rick visit a purge planet where Morty ends up letting loose, finally releases all of his pent-up anger, and murders a vast number of people. While character development in shows like this don't always stick, we're shown that this really will affect Morty's character. I guess you were right. I've got a lot of repressed stuff I need to deal with. Don't worry about it, Morty. Remember those candy bars earlier that we got? Turns out they have a chemical in them called Perginol that amplifies all your violent tendencies. Oh boy. Woo. You're still the same old Morty. Your character is totally protected. The season wraps up with an epic bang when the Smith-Sanchez family are invited to Bird Person and Tammy's wedding. While Rick reluctantly goes, Bird Person admits to Beth that some of the galaxies most wanted are at the wedding. The war in which we fought is far from over. We live our lives in hiding. It turns out that Tammy was a deep cover spy, betrays Bird Person by murdering him, and shoots up several of Rick's closest friends during his time in the Resistance, including Squanchy, who may or may not have survived the event. The family escapes on the run to a tiny planet, which maybe it's just me, but I don't understand how it's better than the larger and stranger corn on the cob planet. Overhearing that the family is miserable due to his actions, in a rare selfless instant, Rick gives himself up to the Gromphlemites and Galactic Federation. He gives Jerry the credit for this. I'm Jerry Smith, and I love sucking big, sweaty boners and licking disgusting, furry testicle sacks. Uh. Okay. And Jerry ends up being assigned a job with the Galactic Federation, where he does, uh, who knows what, but earns a six chewable figure income. This season ends with Mr. Poopy Butthole back on his feet, but clearly in pain and probably addicted to painkillers. Season 3 immediately begins with a few major events. Rick is able to bust out of prison in the Galactic Federation by utilizing a totally fabricated origin story to download a virus into the brainalyzer being used against him. Meanwhile, Summer and Morty escape out of their dimension back into Morty's original dimension, where everyone was turned into a Cronenberg monster. The Citadel of Ricks frees Cronenberg C-137, Summer, Beth, and Jerry, and who knows if they ever unfreeze them, and take our current Summer and Morty into custody. After busting out of prison, Rick works his way into the Citadel of Ricks, transports it right into Galactic Federal Prison, and murders the entirety of the Council of Ricks. He's not done yet though, and completely destabilizes the Galactic Federation, at least for the time being. Watch closely as Grandpa topples an empire by changing a one to a zero. Mr. President, the Blemflark's value just dropped to nothing. What do you mean? I mean, our single centralized galactic currency just went from being worth one of itself to zero. There's a solution here you're not seeing. Beth decides to divorce Jerry, and Rick reveals this was his plan all along because Jerry wanted to turn him in during the season two finale. Tammy makes another appearance, where she and the Galactic Federation have brought Bird Person back to life, now as the cyborg Phoenix Person. Everyone handles the divorce differently and utilize a Mad Max-style alternate dimension and violence to let out their woes. Summer dates and marries the leader of the Deathstalkers, Hemorrhage, before the lack of modern conveniences leads to a quick breakup. Beth tries to bring the family to therapy in order to sort out their issues from the divorce, but Rick transforms himself into a pickle to avoid this. Soon after, we see Morty finally redeem his Morty Adventure card in order to do Vindicators 3, The Return of World Ender. Rick ends up sawing just about all of the Vindicators, with only Supernova surviving the ordeal. 
Jerry finally goes on an adventure with Rick in the Whirly Durly Conspiracy, where, despite their differences, Rick finally gains eh, the slightest hint of respect for Jerry after their minds meld through the cosmic apotheosis experience. Meanwhile, Ethan breaks up with Summer, which she blames on her breast size, and nothing about, you know, marrying an apocalyptic warlord a few episodes earlier while they were still presumably dating. In Rest and Ricklaxation, it's revealed Jessica is broken up with Brad, leaving an opening for Morty. After Morty and Rick get rid of their literal toxicity, Morty confidently asks her out only to turn into a jerk. After he gains his own self back, while Jessica basically helps due to Rick's insistence, it does bring Jessica to know who Morty really is. Morty! Good to have you back. Back to the Citadel of Ricks. The remaining Ricks have created an entire society run by rich Ricks, where they educate Mortys and essentially have a full city of only Ricks and Mortys, with the vast majority disenfranchised. Evil Morty once again makes a return, running a campaign to become president. He manages to win, only for his true self to be revealed to us, the audience, as his former campaign manager fails to warn everyone. This seems like a good time for a drink, and a cold, calculated speech with sinister overtones. In Morty's Mind Blowers, while it's hard to place just about everything in the episode on a timeline, one interesting thing that happens is Morty accidentally hearing Squirrels talk to each other about running the world, causing Rick and Morty to need to escape to another dimension. You f with squirrels, Morty! We got a good five minutes before they're backing up on our ass, Morty! We have to pack up and move to a new reality, Morty! You know, we I said we could only do that a couple of times. We're f***ed over here. Which, ultimately, I don't think is going to affect which dimension the show considers us to be in, and which Beth, Summer, and Jerry we currently happen to be following. At the same time, you never know. And now you can technically say that Rick and Morty C-137 are both no longer in the replacement dimension after the Earth Morty came from turned into Cronenberg monsters, but yet another dimension. In the ABCs of Beth, Beth and Rick learn that Tommy has been trapped in Fruppy Land for his entire adult life. Instead of helping him, Beth can't accept what she did in the past, and instead murders Tommy, proving she's just like her father Rick. They then clone Tommy in order to save his father from being executed for a crime he didn't commit. Rick gives Beth the offer that, if she wants, he can create a perfect clone of her so she can go explore the universe like he did while her clone stays home and watches the kids. Beth considers the offer, and as we learn at the end of Season 4, somewhat accepts it, choosing to let Rick decide for her. I want you to decide. What? For once in my life, I want you to decide, Dad. Do you want me to stay here and be part of your life, or do you want me to leave? He decides to clone her so one can leave and one can stay home, but has absolutely no clue which is which. So at this point, Beth 1 stays home and watches the kids, while Space Beth leaves the family to travel in outer space. Just like her father, Space Beth ends up joining a galactic resistance fighting against the Galactic Federation. Season 3 ends with the President of the United States requesting Rick and Morty help him exterminate vermin, something they both find beneath them. This leads to a standoff between Rick and the President, while Beth 1, worried that she's a clone, finds Jerry and reunites with him thanks to his unconditional love for her. She reunites the family, and ultimately, the season ends with her deciding to be a better parent to Morty and Summer, and that she won't take as much crap from Rick, no longer holding him in such high regard or afraid of him leaving her again. All the while, we learned that Mr. Poopy Butthole got married, had a kid, and... I went back to school and got my GED! In Edge of Tomorty, Rick Die Rick Pete, it's established that Rick is no longer the master of the house, needing to ask Beth permission to take Morty on an adventure with him to get Death Crystals at Forbojulon Prime. What's next, Morty? What if I want you to jump off the Empire State Building? I have to ask? Yes? And you seriously don't see how that's a slippery slope? In an effort to die by Jessica's side, so Morty thinks, he accidentally ends up killing Rick, with Operation Phoenix from Season 2 being referenced, as Rick's consciousness is brought to life as a clone in a parallel universe Rick's Operation Phoenix, and then another, and then another one. As becomes the theme throughout the season, Rick is losing control and his loneliness is starting to really shine through. He somewhat befriends Tony, an alien who's pooped in his secret serene toilet, and shows genuine remorse when Tony loses his life. Beth asserts her control over Rick and the family, not allowing Rick to kill Morty's dreams of pitching a heist film to Netflix. While Rick manages to disillusion Morty from the idea of heists in general... Man, it's as if someone stole his enthusiasm for his own idea. Once again, Rick is no longer in total control of the family. 
We also learn that Mr. Poopy Butthole has gone on to become a professor in African American Women's Studies, however, through the course of the episode, loses his job due to defending himself from karate fighting students Rick has hired. Morty gets a dragon and Clown Hoarder's special victims Morty, but the venture is short-lived when Rick ends up soul bonding with the dragon, breaking the contract, and the group realizes how perverse dragons really are. In Rattle Star Rick Lactica, Morty is bit by an astronaut snake, dashing the dreams of an entire Earth-like civilization where every creature is instead snakes. Feeling bad, Morty returns an Earth snake to the planet, which leads to a Terminator-like plot in which Rick and Morty have to time travel for the first time in the show. Notably, this is the second Christmas we've seen in the show, with the first being in Season 1's Anatomy Park. That would mean that since the start of the show, at least a year has passed at this point. Or it's like a standard cartoon where time doesn't really pass and the characters are perpetually stuck forever in the same age and status, in an existential nightmare dependent on when writers allow them to age. Yeah, something like that. If we are on a strict timeline, that would mean that 2015 is now wrapped up, and now we head into 2016. In Never Ricky Morty, we follow Rick and Morty throughout the episode who, fan theories aside, for the first time turns out to not be Rick and Morty C-137. As it turns out, Morty bought Rick a story train at the Citadel of Rick's gift shop, which means the episode basically just followed action figures the entire time. In Primordius, Summer ends up ruling over a civilization of face-hugging Glorzo aliens. Continuing from Season 2's Look Who's Purging, Morty shows just how much more comfortable he is with massacring aliens now. Damn, feels kind of good when there's no guilt, huh? Yeah, it's, it's like in Star Wars! Yeah, just like in Star Wars. Go nuts! In the Vat of Acid episode, Morty ends up falling in love with a nameless girl and truly growing as a character. He goes through several trials and tribulations with her, learning not to take the easy way out. You seem different. Like, you finally found yourself. Yeah, I, I guess I have. That's good to hear. I like who you found. Yeah, yeah, I, I do too. Looking forward to seeing more. While this is all ruined by Jerry, who accidentally resets everything, and Rick teaches Morty a lesson in one of the best payoffs of any episode so far. Say the vat is good. The vat is good. Kiss the vat. Morty is truly growing beyond being just Rick's dumb sidekick, whose Morty waves can camouflage Rick. Finally, Season 4 ends in Star Mort Return of the Jerai, where Space Beth finally makes her appearance confirming that Beth was in fact cloned. Through an invisibility belt, Summer and Morty learn to become friends and work together, putting away their sibling rivalry. Tammy and the Galactic Federation make a return, who are now after Space Beth instead of Rick. While Rick kills Tammy for good at this point, Phoenix Person makes his return in an epic battle with Rick. The Smith Sanchez family narrowly defeat Phoenix Person, who is still completely in love with Tammy, and now absolutely hates his former best friend Rick. As we learn in Returnal Sunshine of the Spotless Mort, the Federation has suppressed many of Bird Person's memories when they resurrected him as a cyborg, hence the way he acts in this episode. It also turns out that somewhere in between meeting Tammy and Rick defeating him as a cyborg, Bird Person and Tammy had a child together. Given how old their child looks and acts, uh, time and characters aging are definitely inconsistent within the show. Beth and Clone Beth become best friends, and the season ends as the entirety of the Smith Sanchez family leave Rick alone and lonely, not at all interested in him or even which Beth is the clone. The Galactic Federation no longer cares about Rick either, viewing Space Beth as the real threat, and Rick's importance has sunk to an all new low. Which takes us into Season 5. Rick and Morty are on yet another extraordinarily dangerous mission, and are about to die when Morty finally musters up the courage to call Jessica and tell her his feelings. The two arrange to finally go on a date together that very same night. At the same time, Rick and Morty run into Mr. Nimbus, who it turns out is Rick's longtime nemesis. We learn that at some point, Rick had a different sidekick named Kyle. I liked your other one more. What was his name? Kyle? What? Nothing! This is reinforced in Episode 9, Forgetting Sarek Morchel, when Rick spins his Wheel of Morty replacements, and one of the options is Kyle 2.0. While things are going somewhat well for Morty with Jessica, she's pulled into Rick and Morty's typical sci-fi shenanigans and ends up stuck conscious for centuries, changing her completely, and she decides to just be friends. Jerry and Beth, meanwhile, have decided to explore a more open relationship in order to help with their marriage. In Morty Plicity, we learn of Rick's idea to create a decoy family that will help keep the real family safe, although this ultimately self-implodes. 
Now, for the time being past Jessica, Morty ends up dating the conservationist super person Planetina. But after she goes absolutely insane with power, he's forced to break up with her, and we see Beth finally being more of an active parent to him and help him deal with heartbreak and emotions. Rick Dependent Spray sees Morty self-pleasure himself with a horse breeding mount. By a turn of events, this leads to Rick accidentally creating giant Morty's semen monsters that threaten the Earth. As no one is aware this is Morty's seed, Summer suggests enlarging one of her eggs to attract the semen to it. One semen makes it to the egg, which means Morty and Summer have accidentally had a giant incest baby, which is then launched into outer space. The military captures this baby, and tries to train it on a secret base on Mars to become a weapon for them. They also capture Summer and use her to try and train him, however, she falls in love with her baby, names him Naruto, after the anime, and tries to teach him to love. In the meantime, Morty and Summer try to befriend the new kid, Bruce Chutback, before he becomes too cool for them. He, however, turns out to be a jerk and quickly falls to the bottom of the social totem pole after wearing the same pants twice. Rick and Morty then get into more hijinks with the President of the United States. Rick tries to steal the Constitution for a secret treasure map on the back of it, in a plot similar to National Treasure, which once again gets them in trouble with him. As it's near Thanksgiving, Rick devises a plan to become a turkey so he can be pardoned by the President. But he's pulled this trick off before, for many years, once again making an accurate timeline by years pretty much not going to happen. How many times have you done this? I don't know, Jerry. How many years have I lived here? Careful how you answer that. Jeez, Rick, you know, you've, you've done this a lot. Through the events of the episode, with Rick and the president needing to join size to fight off a turkey president imposter, it seems Rick and the president gain more respect for each other. On the way to finally visit Boob World, Rick, Summer, and Morty chance upon a blue Gotron ferret, completing Rick's collection. All of this leads to the Smith-Sanchez family eventually teaming up with a slightly older Naruto Smith in order to defeat an anime crew piloting a Gotron. In Ricternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mort, Rick decides it's finally time to save Bird Person and deprogram him. He hops into Bird Person's mind, where he discovers a locked away, suppressed memory that Bird Person and Tammy had a child together. While he manages to save Bird Person's mind, Bird Person's child is revealed to currently be contained in a Federation prison asteroid. Bird Person's daughter is revealed to be violent, but only when provoked. In forgetting Sarek Morchel, Morty steals Rick's portal gun in order to fix various places post their adventures. This leads to Rick deciding to jokingly replace Morty with two crows. However, Rick bonds with the two crows and grows as a person. He admits his relationship with Morty was incredibly abusive, gives Morty his portal gun, and leaves to adventure with the crows. Oh sh Rick and two crows! Kicking off my new franchise! This leads to Rick Mirai Jack, with Rick following the two crows on a never-ending battle to find their arch-nemesis Crow Scare, the Scarecrow. This all turns out to be a farce, however, and Rick returns to a Morty who's aged himself up to 40 at the Citadel, bringing them back to the Citadel. Evil Morty requests a dinner with them so he can scan Rick's brain for the plans to the Citadel. As it turns out, this is a quick process due to Rick's brain being scanned back in closer encounters of the Rick kind by Evil Rick, who was being controlled by Evil Morty for this very purpose. Evil Morty finally reveals his plan, which he's taken over the Citadel in order to accomplish, and the very reason why he hacked Rick's portal gun and was using Evil Rick to scan his brain. Evil Morty wants to break out of the central finite curve, where Rick is the smartest man in every possible universe, and into the possible set of universes where Rick is no longer the smartest man. Evil Morty kills practically every Rick and Morty on the Citadel by hacking into their portal fluid, so they'll all end up trying to escape to deadly dimensions, like the Blender Dimension. He even hacks Operation Phoenix, so all Ricks and Mortys who have built this backup contingency will also die, and reroutes their blood to help power his machine. Evil Morty succeeds in this plan, and is able to escape outside of the central finite curve, where his portal gun now shoots a golden portal. It's possible he hasn't just escaped, but the central finite curve is also now completely destroyed. Meanwhile, our Rick and Morty manage to escape total annihilation by escaping with a number of Mortys to Mortyburg, where they dislodge from the Citadel and just barely manage to avoid getting sucked into universal black hole Evil Morty had created. Meanwhile, we learn that Mr. Poopy Butthole has fallen into hard times. 
he never got his university job back and isolated himself from his wife in his depression. Which brings us to the end of season 5. So that wraps up the entire timeline so far of Rick and Morty. With much of Rick's backstory now explained, what are you hoping to see next? And what do you think we'll start to see now that the central finite curve has been dismantled? Are you looking forward to the inevitable return of Bird Person's daughter? Let us know in the comments below, be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time.